For the talk this morning, uh, what, what I want to say something about is uh, how large is it? What are we talking about? Uh, that's something I think that uh, always is very close to my heart. Um, building the library of, of life. What is this? What does it entail to? And then lastly, uh, the road ahead. Where are we going with uh, fungal biodiversity research? I also want to address the elephant in the room, which we all see and we all prefer not to talk about. So I personally think that the biggest accomplishment we have, uh, as a community have had in the last uh, 10 years or so has been this Aftal Tree of Life, uh, which many of you in this room participated in. And it gave us our first overview of uh, kingdom fungi ph phylogeny. So it, this was really great. But now, uh, this afternoon, Joey will be talking about the F1000 project. And uh, it's not unforeseeable that when the next big phylogeny of king, uh, kingdom fungi is shown, that it will be on genome basis. So this is really a game changer. And very important for us to also be involved in that. So species numbers. Most of us are still adhering to the David Hawksworth estimate of 1.5 million because that's what there is, right? This is, this is what, we, what we use and what we uh, play around with. Um, but uh, as you know, in 2011, this uh, paper appeared in PLOS Biology and uh, trying to, to estimate how many species there were on Earth. And uh, what's quite alarming is that for fungi, they only reckoned that there were 43 thousand species. How, how come? You know, we've got 400 odd thousand names in microbank. We say more or less that there's 100,000. How come they only say, say there's 43? Well, why are people other than mycologists, other than the in crowd, so confused? And in the same year, uh, uh, Meredith uh, Blackwell publishes a paper and says, well, maybe it's not 1.5 million, but 5.1. You know, so uh, why is this? Maybe we should look at new emerging uh, technologies like uh, DNA barcoding, which uh, gives us the ability to uh, link different morphs of the same fungus. And uh, it's, it's, it's really a very, very powerful tool. And this technology is being employed uh, in all our museums and uh, uh, natural history collections now. And in Europe, we've got this group called NEL, the Network of European Leading Labs, where they take the existing collection and add a barcoding pipeline on top of that to transfer these specimens into barcode. So very important and powerful uh, group to have. But of course, they have to develop all these data flow systems to link the trace files to the sequences, to the names, to the specimens, and all the descriptions and associated metadata. And if you want to do it on a really big scale like we are doing at CBS, you also need to develop your own limbs so that you can trace who has used what uh, tack and on what day and uh, where is the DNA now. So it's a very, if you're doing thousands of these a week, it, it becomes a complicated process. Um, and these data eventually move into a database that's uh, accessible via different portals. And uh, this is also a theme I will come back to again. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so um, DNA barcoding as an approach is not only being used in fungi, and you should realize that this is actually being actively used in whatever form of life you see when you walk outside. It's in fish and fleas and birds. It's everywhere. They're all doing it. So it's, it's very good for us to be involved in such an exercise. In Europe, we had our last uh, European Consortium for the Barcode of Life meeting in Braga in Portugal in 2010. And for those of you who are interested, the next meeting will be in uh, Brussels in September of this year. So these are really very exciting meetings to go to because people have data on everything from bats and tall grasshoppers. It's very exciting stuff. Um, but for the fungal community, we gathered here last year to debate the best gene for fungi. And this is something that Konrad Choch will be addressing you on later today. And uh, very exciting uh, findings that, that came out of this. But it also showed us that uh, the ITS is not the be-all and the end-all. And for many groups of fungal genera, we need to supplement it with other specific genes. 
Which genes? You know, what, what do you sequence when you're working on genus X or genus Y to supplement your ITS to really delineate the, the cryptic species? So probably next year when we meet here again for our spring symposium, the topic will be genes and genomes to address these aspects. Very exciting stuff indeed. And last year we also had this one fungus, one name uh, symposium, which really enabled us now to move to a situation where we can use one name for uh, a genus. And um, it means that we are cleaning up our trees and uh, the former situation you have there on the left and the new situation you have on the right, although we're still debating the Aportifomopsis, but <laughs> beside the point. <laughs> so it's, it's really very nice for beginners in mycology to, to uh, uh, find such a situation. One of my favorite uh, uh, quotes is, uh, show me a plant pathogen, I will show you a species complex. And uh, one thing that we need to realize is that we've uh, passed the point where we can uh, recognize these cryptic species on morphology only. And we'll probably have to rely on separating them based on multi-gene data and in future probably genomic data as this becomes available. Um, and these data all move into various databases, like this one uh, which uh, Vincent made for Kerry O'Donnell, uh, using uh, um, multi-locus sequence data to identify species of Fusarium. So these specific tailored um, generic databases for identification is something that we really believe in and that we are developing at a, a, a rapid clip. The same approach is also being done in many other genera. This is, for instance, uh, Colatotricum, a process that was initially very actively pushed by uh, Kevin Hyde and Kai in, in China and Ulrika Dam and uh, many others. So um, by doing this, they have uh, screened many genera and identified a core set of six, uh, uh, many genes, identified a core set of six that, that you need to use to accurately delineate these cryptic uh, entities. So, another favorite quote I have is, show me a genus and I will show you a para and polyphyletic assemblage of taxa. Now, this is complicated, especially in the one uh, uh, genus scenario which we are talking about uh, today. And um, this then brings us to uh, our fungal working group, which convened here last year to discuss the, the best gene uh, um, process, which was just <laughs> published in, in uh, PANAS. Um, so, this is where we're at now in our roadmap. We've, we've got the ITS barcode, uh, which Conrad will uh, inform you more about, and we're trying to move to this one name for our uh, genera and our species. Another aspect which uh, Conrad will uh, address concerns the bag or fungi initiative, which is really uh, very important. And um, I think I will leave it to him to explain. And this leads to the genera of fungi initiative, which we will be developing in Microbank, trying to get all these genera and adding their descriptions and illustrations and their uh, uh, DNA signatures. This is, is really something very important and something which all of you need to contribute to. So there's about uh, 15,000 uh, genera, you asked? 15? 15,000, and um, uh, not, uh, not that many of them are known from, from sequence. I don't know what that number is. Mm. But uh, so a lot of recollecting is necessary. So we need, we need field mycologists. This is really a, a, a process we all need to uh, buy in on. Um, and this will enable us to develop these polyphasic identification keys. Keith, where you, you love that word. Um, to identify all the species in these uh, genera. And this sets up the MycoID blast uh, system, which uh, uh, Vincent was also uh, talking about and was launched last week, and uh, eventually paves the way to Joey's project, uh, the F1000 and other genomic uh, initiatives. So all very important for the fungal working group. When we met in Edinburgh, this was one of uh, David Hibbert's slides in his keynote, and I think probably the, the most important slide. What it shows you is that per year over the last 10 years, we've been describing as a community uh, 1,250 species on average. But what's alarming is that per year, only 20% of these species are known from a sequence, more or less. So, for those of you who are somewhat older like me and who have children at home, you will know that 
60% is the minimum pass rate for any <laughs> subject or discipline. So as my college and as my colleges, we have failed and failed miserably. So I think our biggest challenge for the coming years is to address this. How can we shift this balance from 20% to 80%? How can we get to a situation where 80% of what's being described each year is known from sequence? This is really crucially important that, that uh, we think about this. So how, how can we improve the statistics with this? When names come into a uh, microbank, one thing that we can do is, is uh, suggest or try to help by providing uh, DNA barcodes for uh, submissions. So if you submit a culture now to CBS, we will by default return to you a free barcode ITS and LSU. The same should be applicable to other culture collections. If we get this to operate throughout the world, then we would already be helping people who, who don't have uh, the facilities available to generate uh, barcodes, at least at, at ITS level. Um, about a week ago, the new microbank uh, platform uh, went live, and there's still a lot of things we're uh, developing with this. But uh, a major important point is uh, MycoID, which I think is really a very significant development for all of us. And MycoID allows you to access different databases and to blast your own unknown sequence uh, to different databases, not only GenBank or in combination, whatever you choose. It will also have on there the CBS uh, database with thousands of um, unreleased sequences. So the, it's really very powerful tools that, that will become available and useful for people to use. But back then on to the species numbers and the species known and uh, not known from, from sequence. So over the years 2006 to 2010, uh, most of the species were described in these journals. And uh, what you will see is that over this period, most of the species were described in mycotaxon, mycologia, and, and fungal diversity. The, the dark purple bar are the number of species that had ITS to, to supplement the name. But if these journals were to look at their policies, all that will happen is that the, the, the papers that they reject because they don't have DNA data will simply move to the other journals. So as a community, we need to decide that mycology needs DNA data to supplement novelties. Obviously, in many cases, this won't be possible. There are fungi that you can't cultivate. There are fungi that you just can't get DNA out of. I've run into them. They, they're there. But it's something that we really need as a default setting. Because I honestly believe that descriptions lacking cultures or DNA are incomplete species hypothesis. This is quite a radical statement, but it's, it's something to think about when you're cycling on your bicycle. I, I think this is quite a good point. So we're debating today lists of accepted species. But I think what's even more important than lists of accepted species are lists of acknowledged species. Do you really acknowledge a name without a sequence? You know, it's still an opinion. Uh, you know, how far do we take it? Agreed. But still, it's a, this is something to think about. We, we need to address these issues. So, rounding off, we've got many databases uh, at, at CBS that's linked to a central uh, database. And uh, I really believe in, in this approach. So, for the lack of a better name, I'm calling it now the IMS, I'm a fungal database. And I think that what really would be ideal for all of us is if we could end up with a situation that if um, Amy changes something in her database, it's reflected in Microbank. Or if Paul changes something in Index Fungorum, it's reflected in Amy's uh, database, or vice versa. A core set of data needs to be available and shared in the IMA central database. We have reached the point where we cannot really continue to um, waste this uh, number of man hours and, and, and finances by duplicating everything over and over again. These services should be linked to provide the optimal use for mycologists globally. I really think this is uh, very, very important.
on behalf of CBS, I thank you for your attention.